I am so glad you are here this morning, but I have to tell you, I don't know why you're here this morning. Do you people not realize what you should be doing? I mean, this is Saturday, and I bet some of you haven't even got the shower gift bought yet, and some of you need to go home and fix Sunday dinner, and here you think you've got time to come to a women's retreat. And there's some of you that probably drove 50, 100, 150 miles, and you're going to go back home. And I'm just going to tell you, you're going to be 24 hours behind when you get home. (laughs) I'm going to talk about stress. (laughs) I want them to shoot up a couple of these uh, pictures I thought were pretty cute. (laughs) Next time you have your little house dog underneath you, think what they're thinking. (laughs) And this one, I'm so stressed out over being stressed out that I can't even remember why I'm stressed out, and it's stressing me out. (laughs) I'm afraid I'm one of those people that um, I create my own stress. Like when I clean, I make a bigger mess before it is finished. Um, I I start with a bigger mess, and then I finally get back to that. Everything's just double the trouble with me. When I travel, I've had so many experiences experiences in traveling, and they're just crazy sometimes. Like the time I was up to Kansas City, and I was supposed to fly out to New Mexico to speak, and I get to the ticket counter because it's not going through the little machine like it could, should. And she says to me, well, do you realize that you made your reservation for last week? I did what? And I mean, I'm just really almost in tears because I'm supposed to go out there, fly out there, be speaking that uh, night, and they had one ticket left on that plane, the Lord knows. Takes cares of children and fools. There was the other, oh, uh, there's been a couple of times where I've just missed my plane because they changed the gate on me, and and I think one time it was because I was so interested in my book, I didn't hear them change the gate number. But there was one particular that just takes the cake. It was when I was supposed to be speaking in Cincinnati, and uh, the couple that was going to take care of me was Dr. North and his wife, who's a very well-known professor up there. And he is a very proper man, and so is his wife. And Randy had had him for his master's program. And so when I left, Randy said to me, please don't embarrass me. <laughs> <clears throat> so... So I go up there, I get through with speaking, and uh, I, uh, Dr. North and his wife pick me up, and they take me to the place I'm going to be staying there on campus. They said, we'll be back in just a little bit. We want to take you out to, he- to eat. We had a lovely dinner. On the way back to where they were taking me back, where I'm staying on campus, I said to them, I just, I want you to remember, this is the time when the daylight savings changes, so just, just know that that's going to be happening. We're so glad you told us. We wouldn't have even maybe thought of that. And I said, well, I did think of that. I mean, I feel (laughs) pretty good about it. So, and um, so they let me out and they go home and I get, for some reason that night, I never do this. I get all of my clothes out on the bed that I'm going to need the next morning. I check my alarm clock about three or four times, get up the next morning. I'm just so thrilled and just doing well. And the place that I'm staying used to be a dorm, and they've redone it into these motel room type things. But you still have a bathroom that you share with other people. There was no one else in the building. But uh, I I'm, I'm, went down, got my shower. I come out. And as I'm, as I'm trying to get my clothes on, well, Dr. Norris' wife just is staying there in the doorway. And she says, Julie what are you doing? I said, well, I thought I was getting ready. Um, (laughs) She said, do you understand? We've been trying to get into this building for 30 minutes. We've called the night watchman, everything. We're finally here. But we should have left about 20 minutes ago. And there I am in my little undecent, you know. I said, give me five. 
So I hurry and I'm thinking, Randy said, don't embarrass me. Don't, don't embarrass me. And so I hurry out and I, I just look like a disaster. My hair has been sop and wet. Fortunately, back then I had perms, so it just was kind of a big mess instead of flat. So I go out and it is pitch dark because the time has changed. And I'm thinking, I can't show up at the, at the airport like this. And they're so worried, I'm just going to miss the plane anyway. And they're going to have to deal with me longer. And so I, I just, I'm in the back seat. And I'm trying to have, I'm so apologetic. And, but I'm putting my makeup on in the dark. <laughs> <clears throat> and so I get it on and I, I pull out my blush and... And I'm thinking, well, that doesn't feel right. I bet it needs more. And, and then I do my eyes, and, and um, we get to the airport. She runs in to see if I'm going to make it. Yes, you're going to make it. Dr. North, they get out. They look at me. They say, it's been real. <laughs> Good riddance. <laughs> and so I go. I run. I run to the gate, which is a long ways just, they're boarding, but I have time to run into the bathroom just to see how I look. And I'm just going to tell you, gals, I look like I'm selling something. <laughs> and it's not encyclopedias. <laughs> it was bad. <laughs> I get home, I tell Randy this story, he says, you are going to write them, aren't you? <laughs> yes, I am. I come from a long family of stressors. I, please, when I say this, don't think I'm making fun of my dear, dear mother. But my mom was uh, four and a half years in the nursing home before she passed away, and it's been about three years ago. And uh, you would think when you get to the rest home, that stress would finally be gone. I mean, it is called rest home. <clears throat> but my mother had Parkinson's, and she had dementia, and she just said some funny things sometimes. And I, many conversations I had with her, she would say things like, I wish there was something to do. Do you think I could go do the dishes down there? And my mother is perfectly, she's incapable of doing anything for herself. But that's what she was thinking. One day, she says, when I go in, could I have the classified ads? <laughs> I said, well, sure. Yeah, mom, that'd be fine. Um, I said, well, what do you need them for? She said, I'm going to look for a job. <laughs> so she is, <laughs> she is looking at that paper. And you know she's not reading anything. She's looking. And then pretty soon she just is so disgusted and she puts it down. And I said, what's wrong? She said, what am I thinking? Who's going to hire a 90-year-old woman? <laughs> I get stress. I really do. I get it because I live with me. <laughs> My husband has said to me frequently, um, Julie, it must be so hard being you. <laughs> and he usually follows that up with, I am so thankful I am not a woman. <laughs> I have been a minister's wife for nearly 40 years. And so not only have I had my own crises to deal with, I feel like at times I've had everybody else's. I've told my daughter here a while back, I said, I feel like I've lived from one deadline to another. How many of you feel like that sometimes? It's just one thing we're preparing for and then we present, and then we prepare, and then we present, and then we prepare, and we present, and it can be exhausting. I can identify with those of you who live in the sandwich generation, which means you are taking care still of kids and grandkids on this end, and at the other end, 
You are trying your best to take care of aging parents and loved ones, and you are sandwiched in between. Now, after 40 years, I am a working gal. <laughs> this may be the funnest thing I've ever done in my life to be here at Ozark. I actually bring home a paycheck. I have never seen it yet, but Randy tells me I bring home one. <laughs> I've, grown, I've gone through seasons of crummy health, and it's stressful. I've gone through seasons where I feel like I'm dealing with too many people. And then I've had seasons where I feel like I don't have enough people, and the loneliness settles in, and that can be stressful. Sometimes, people, I get so stressed that I have to watch the national evening news just to unwind. <laughs> I know stress, and you do too. We all have stress. But how, the question is not do we have it, the question is, is how are we going to deal with it? Because we've been told if we don't deal with it wisely, it will have spiritual consequences. Have you noticed that not all tensions push us closer to the Lord? Sometimes they separate us. Not dealing with it wisely can have physical consequences. My goodness, I got on the internet and just looked up all the stuff that you can have Physically, I'm not going to tell you what they are because it would stress you out. <clears throat> Send the hypochondriates running out of here. <laughs> not dealing with it wisely is, it's, it has mental consequences. If you've been around me for any length of time, and I say this over and over and over again, we're all about this far from mental illness. We just are because depression is just across the way and anxiety is just there. Not all stress is bad. In fact, it, some of it has to be actually helpful. But when we begin to experience a build of it, a buildup of it, when we feel the squeeze and we no longer have joy and, and we no longer cope with people, the people that we care about and, and love, when we don't have that, then we need to do something. Paul understood stress. I want you to look in 1 Corinthians, and if, you know, I can just read this even very quickly for you. Listen to the stressors that he had in his life. This is first, or 2 Corinthians 11. He says this, I have worked harder, been put in prison more often, been whipped times without number, and faced death again and again. Five different times the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and day adrift at sea. You've heard this list, but listen to it again. I have traveled on many long journeys. I've faced danger from rivers and from robbers. I have faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles. I have faced dangers in the cities, in the deserts, on the sea. I have faced danger from men who claim to be believers but are not. I have worked hard and long, enduring many sleepless nights. I have been hungry, thirsty, have gone without food, have shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. Then besides all this, I have the daily burden of my concern for all the churches. The only stressor in that whole list I can even begin to identify with is the burden of the church. And yet, listen to how Paul says he could handle his stress. And she read it, Jody read it this morning. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are hunted, hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. Wow! How do you endure those kinds of stressors, that kind of punishment, and still not get knocked down? 
which brings up the question, do you, like Paul, have the internal resources to deal with the external pressures that are just there in life because people, the real question is not, or the real stress is not the difficulty of our circumstances. The real stress is the ineffectiveness of our responses. I'm going to call this talk Four Habits and a Promise. This is going to be one of the simplest talks you've ever heard. But it comes straight by from Paul. And if he can use these simple things, I guess I can too. We're going to be camping out in Philippians 4. These, this is a section I know that most of you are going to know well. You probably have some section of this put on a wall hanging and hanging in a bathroom or a bedroom or somewhere where you will read it every little bit. But this is huge in its implications for how we can deal with the external pressures of life. In Philippians 4... He gives us a promise that can be ours. He says this. This is the promise. He will give you peace that what? Passes all understanding. A peace that passes all understanding. That's a big promise. In effect, Paul is saying that God will put fence around our logic, our mind, he says. He will protect us, our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. That's what he's saying. And so our mind is where we reason. Our hearts, he said, that's our emotions. So basically, God will come along and he will give us this peace that will protect even our emotions, even when we're in an emotional turmoil, and our reasoning, which always isn't great reasoning. Now, I'd like to get a piece of that piece, wouldn't you? I mean, wouldn't you like to enjoy some peace and quiet down in the depths of your soul? Wouldn't you like to give your mind a chance to just rest? Would you like to sleep soundly? Would you like to be a nicer person? <laughs> Would you like to be underwhelmed for a change? Would you like to clean up the messes that stresses have left in your life? That's the promise. Peace. And the older I get, the more I appreciate peace. But ladies, as you know, with every promise of God, there is a premise. There is a basis. There is a condition. If you do this, you will get this. For example, seek me with all of your heart and what? You will find me. Believe in him and you will have eternal life. So today, I want to talk about the four habits that God's peace will inhabit. I thought that was clever. <laughs> <laughs> and I want you to know, people, this is not gobbledygook, self-help, motivational talk. This is what Paul wrote when he was, don't, don't you think the man had concerns? Oh, my word. And this is how he found he could deal with it. And my pressures are not as great as his are, and yet they're my pressures. And so learning how to have some kind of way to deal with those stressors, it's really important. I'm going to start with the second one because I want to go back to the first one and end on that one. The first stressor he says, or, or the first thing he says, the first habit to put in your life is don't worry about anything. Don't worry about what? 
anything. And doggone it, Paul, you just say it so like, I mean, these are imperative sentences he's going to use. And he is emphatic in his use of these imperative sentences. Don't worry about anything. And I want to say, Paul, are you kidding me? Have you seen my bank account? Don't worry. But my kids are driving me. Don't, don't worry. And Paul, have you seen the weather? Do you know where we live? We live in Joplin, Missouri. And do you know what things come through here? <laughs> don't worry. And, and Paul, I listen to the news. And, and, and the terrorists. I mean, they're, they're, they're not that far away, Lord. And he says, don't worry, there just seems to be no wiggle room, no shades of gray, no exceptions. There will never be a time when God will say to you, okay, now you can worry. <laughs> I think sometimes a visual aid is helpful. And so I'm going to use this visual aid. I want you to look at this problem or this uh, balloon and think of this as your problem, okay? We got that? I'm really glad I got spared that. I'm not a good balloon blower. This is still your problem. It's intrinsically the same thing. Either this way or this way. But when I do this, I'm just filling it with a bunch of hot air. <laughs> and that's what worry does. It takes a problem and fills it with a bunch of what ifs. What if? What if I get laid off? What if he breaks up with me? What if I forget to call her on her birthday? What if I don't like the color I paint the walls? That's for my daughter. <laughs> what if she doesn't forgive me? What if the cancer comes back? What if I get sick on the airplane? It's still the same problem, people. It's just exaggerated. It's just blown out of proportion. It's just magnified. But it's nothing of substance that has been added. I don't want to be offensive when I say this, but when you worry about something you cannot change, that you have no control over, can I just tell you, that's dumb. <laughs> I'm telling myself too, that's not terribly smart. We're brighter than that. And when you worry about something that you can change, stuff you can do something about, then for goodness sake, do it. Solve it, fix it, finish it, face it. Forgive it, but don't worry about it. Jesus has something to say about worry on the Sermon on the Mount, and I'm going to turn to Matthew 6, and I want you to just listen, and that way you won't, won't have to be uh, trying to hassle yourself with finding that passage. But this is what he says in Matthew 6, Sermon on the Mount, starting with verse 25. That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food and drink or, whether, or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they, how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing. Yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers... 
that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, will he certainly care for you? Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things, about what to eat or what will we drink or what will we wear. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. So I learned some things when I look at that passage. First of all, worry is unnatural. Do you realize that we as humans are the only ones of his creation that worry? And he uses the point of the birds. The point is not the security of the birds. The the point is their carelessness, their carefreeness. They're not flapping around worrying. (laughs) Once again, we learn something from the birds and the bees. Worry is useless, I learned from this scripture. Nobody can add anything to their life of consequence. Worry signals we have grown distant to God. He says, this is what unbelievers do. This is how they handle life. But you're not unbelievers. When I talk about worry, don't don't think that I don't understand There are problems in life, and we have legitimate concerns, and you couldn't be unconcerned for the life of you. You just can't be. If you've got kids, if you've got family, if you've got jobs, there's going to be concerns. What I'm asking you is also this. I I don't want you to try to dumb down your, your concerns, to, to make them, to be so clueless about them that you can't even recognize the obvious. My daughter Katie and I, um, before we came last night, had just enough time to grab a bite to eat at Wendy's. We were in the drive through window. Uh, we weren't in the window, but we were. <laughs> <laughs> we were going through the drive through Katie's driving. And she gives the order to the gal. And, the, you know, these are funny things sometimes. And, and so she gives, uh, Katie wanted chicken nuggets. I wanted a baked potato. And then Katie said, um, I'd like a, a medium water. And then could you give me another medium water? And, and so the girl says back, so is that two medium waters? And for some reason, it just hit both of us funny. I mean, like, yes. That would be one and one, two. And there could be a thousand things wrong with that. She could have maybe just not heard or whatever, but it just seemed like you are stating the obvious. That's, yes. We're not asking you to be clueless about your problems. What we are asking you is when you begin to stew, when you begin to worry, that you recognize it for what it is and know that is a blinking light. That is a siren that you need to go and do something else. And so that's the first habit. We don't worry about what? Anything. But instead, we pray about? He's so big in his words. There's no wiggle room. Have you noticed that? Don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. And here's the encouraging news. Never will we hear God say, like I said before, okay, now it's time to worry. The encouraging news is there will never be a time when you need to worry. And so that means then when I want to worry about the bank account, he says to pray about it. When the kids are driving me crazy, I 
pray about it. When the weather is the big deal this spring, and I just heard we're supposed to have some really big storms. I pray. When the terrorists are coming, I pray. I have read, girls, that there are over 6,000 promises in the Bible. 6,000 promises. I've never counted them. 6,000 promises in the Bible. And here's the conclusion I come to. The only reason we would resort to useless worry is because we do not know the promises of God. Can I just get an amen on that? And, and let me tell you this. We, we, need to, we need to make this very clear. Thinking about the situation is not the same as praying. I can't tell you how many times I have thought over and over and over, but I have never sat down to pray about it. I was kidding myself that I was. I even wrote a poem about it several years. Lord, I've stewed, several years ago. Lord, I've stewed and I've worried and I've thought I was praying when all I was doing was simply replaying the hurt, the wound the circumstance, doubting and deciding, there's not a chance that you would choose to intercede, to move, to heal, to make me believe that you care, but you do, and you have, and you will, and so I rest in that, and I finally grow still. Let me give you some of the promises of God. 1 Peter 5, 7, cast all your anxieties, your cares on him because he cares for you. That word cast does not mean like throwing the line out for trout fishing. That means you take this bundle of anxieties that you have and you let them go. And no, I'm not going to sing, let it go. <laughs> James 4.2 tells us, you don't have because you don't ask. Ask. Billy Graham said one time, heaven is full of answers to prayers for which no one bothered to look. Wow. Matthew 7, 9 through 11 if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask him? Romans 8, 32, if God did not spare his own son, but he gave himself up for us, won't he also give us everything else? People, he's done the hard thing. Don't you think he can take care of our little stuff? There's a wonderful story in the book of Chronicles. It's seven, or, um, the 20th chapter of 2 Chronicles. It's about a good king by the name of Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat... Um, had been told, or the Israelites had been told years ago, there's certain tribes from God, God told them, I don't want you to bother, don't bother them. But now, that was during the Exodus, but now, here in Jehoshaphat's time, they're coming to cause war against the Israelites. It's the Moabites and the Ammonites and the Meonites. It, it, for all I know, it could be the Parasites and the Stroblites and... <laughs> Car lights. <clears throat> and the messengers came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army from Edom is marching against you from beyond the Dead Sea. And Jehoshaphat was terrified by this news. And he begged God for guidance. He also ordered everyone in Judah to begin fasting so people from all the towns of Judah came to Jerusalem to seek the Lord's help. And Jehoshaphat stood before the community of Judah and Jerusalem in front of the new courtyard. 
at the temple of the Lord and he prayed, O Lord God of our ancestors, you alone are the God who is in heaven. You are ruler of the kingdoms of the earth. He went back through and he told, he, it was just a, a prayer of thanksgiving and it was a prayer of how he knew God was going to deliver them. Later on in that assembly, there is a man that the Spirit of God comes upon and he says, listen, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem. Listen, King Jehoshaphat, this is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid. Don't be discouraged by this mighty army. For the battle is not yours. It is God's. Even further down, he says, but you will not even need to fight. Take your positions and stand still and watch the Lord's victory. You know what they did? They were so confident, they sent the choir out ahead of the soldiers. And when they began to sing, God caused the army of the enemy to move against one another and Israel did not have to lift a finger. Wow. Why would we worry when we have a God like that who just wants to answer if we would just ask Matthew 7, 7 and 8 says, Keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. But let me just say this. Give him time to answer the door. (laughs) In a society that has learned to expect and feels entitled to instant gratification, we may need to learn to wait. If you are a worrier, I strongly recommend that you learn the promises of God. Memorize them. And then you will become a prayer. I also want to add very quickly in this, I think Paul tells us to pray not just for the sake of receiving an answer to our needs. Girls, I've, I've just had the most wonderful experiences the last month or two. As a 60-year-old woman, I feel like some things I'm just getting. I've been studying a lot about Romans 8. I'm actually auditing Romans this semester. And uh, I've learned something about God's love. When I pray, I go into a throne room of God. I, somehow I am transferred from time and space to the very throne room of God. And I enter that room <laughs> with my little bag of problems in hand. And I meet the Father who loves me. And to borrow from the words of the old hymn, he walks with me and he talks with me. (laughs) And he tells me I am his own. And with the Spirit helping me, I begin to worship. And and when I begin to worship, I let go of my bag of burdens that just a few minutes earlier were so overwhelming. And it is in that worship that my greatest need is taken care of, and that's me. I don't have time to take you to another scripture. I want you to put it down, Psalm 73. Asaph is so upset about people in the world and how the wicked seem to be faring so well and the righteous are not. And he's so frustrated. But when he goes into worship, 
that's when his whole attitude is changed. Corey Ten Boom said, look to the world and you'll be distressed. Look within and you'll be depressed. <laughs> but look at Christ and you'll be at rest. Third habit, think about good things. Things that are true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Do any of you watch TV? Let's see a show of hands. I want to just see it. Everybody admit. If, this, if you watch TV, this is what you've been thinking about. Things that are false and dishonorable and wrong and impure, ugly and detestable. And that's just the presidential race. But we are called to think about things that are excellent and praiseworthy. Clear back in 1890, a man by the name of William James said this, It has been said that the greatest weapon against stress is our ability to choose one thought over another. The scientists back then thought he was nuts. <laughs> They, they felt like the brain was so rigidly mapped out and that certain of parts of the brain controlled certain functions. But it turns out they were wrong. And that's really good news. The brain is very adaptable. And so for stroke victims and people with mental illness to know that their brain can be rewired and that parts of the brain can take over what is lacking, what is missing, what has died, what is damaged is really good news. But it's good news for just regular folk too. And I'm putting myself in that category, which might be a little over the top. <laughs> it means this, that the repetitive positive thought and positive activity can rewire your brain and strengthen brain areas that stimulate positive feelings. Isn't that amazing? And I have read in books like Who Switched Off My Brain that the brain can begin to rewire in as little as three or four days through the exercise of repetitive, positive thought. That is miraculous. I want to go back to that list that Paul gave, those things that are admirable and worthy and so forth. And yes, I'm watching the clock and I'm just about to through. Ultimately, all those adjectives that he used in that list are characteristics of God. Isn't that something? So Isaiah 26, 3 tells us this, and it's so significant. You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, and then listen to this, the same language, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. Now I want to go back up to the top of this passage, starting with verse 2. We read that there's something going on in the church at Philippi, Yodia and Synthike. They've got a disagreement. I don't know if one of them's an older gal. She's the guard, the old guard. I don't know if one of them's younger and she's got fresh ideas and... They're clashing. I don't know what the problem was, but it was a big enough problem that Paul actually is addressing it publicly. How would you like to be these two? <laughs> I, I, I don't want you to forget, though, these were women that had done incredible things for the Lord. And he wants them to get this taken care of. And I don't think it's by accident. I don't think there's an abrupt change of thought from verse 3 to verse 4. I think he's carrying out this. This is one of the ways we settle things, people. Again, with such emphatic language, he says this. Always rejoice in the Lord. You know, um, if, if, have you ever considered that a good amount of the stress we encounter is because we get turned sideways with someone or something? 
Work schedules, we get at odds with our personal agendas. Lack of money is at odds with our dreams and our agendas. Advancing age puts us at odds with what we still want to do. Bad health puts us at odds with living. People get at odds with each other. What are the odds for a happiness of spirit when you just feel at odds with the world? The only way to handle life when you feel like the odds are against you is to never be at odds with God. Be glad you know God. Be glad he knows you. Be glad he cares for you and every little thing you're going through. Be glad and know he is working for you. Be glad he forgives you. Always be rejoicing in the Lord. Gals, these are four habits that are easy to understand, but hard to do. And that's why Paul would say this, practice Practice these things. Let them become your habits so that God's peace will inhabit you. That's what he says. Practice these things and the God of peace will be yours. Amen. 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 God bless you people. (laughs)